to a quorum. We're counting, though, just to make sure. Good morning, good morning. Good morning, this is Caesar. Good morning. Am I in, Mr. Oswald? You're here, Mr. Rhodes. You're in. All right. <laughs> we're, doing, sure. we, we're, do, we're doing good when we have uh, the Glades represented here. Appreciate you being here. Do you have the... Okay, Mr. Chair. We'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, can we have a what? meeting to order? We would like to call a roll call. Ten oh five. Okay. We convene at ten oh five. Ten o'clock. Yeah, we call the meeting to order at 10, reconvene at 10.05. Okay. All right. Adopt a family, Jessica Pagan. Here, present online. Best foot forward, Debbie Elman. Present online. Black Chamber of Commerce, Hello. Cassandra Oliver. Present. Mm -hmm. Card at FAU, Jack Scott. Card at FAU, Sabrina Degogis. Present online. Coalition for Black Student Achievement, Dr. Deborah Robinson. Coalition for Black Student Achievement, Deborah Stewart. Compass, Amanda Canetti. Compass, Rex Barnes. Connect to Greatness, Dr. Cassandra Corbin Thaddeus. Present online. Okay. And connect to greatness, Andre Thaddeus. Present online. Okay. District ESC Advisory Committee, Kimberly Spire O. Present online. District ESC Advisory Committee, Michelle Beatty. Present online. Division of Blind Services, Cesar Vigo. He's online? Yeah, I see him. Okay. All right. Let's see. Economic Council of Palm Beach County, Craig McKenzie. El Sol Jupiter, Suzanne Whitbeck. Florida Hispanic American Chamber of Commerce, Juan Pagan. Present. Florida Hispanic American Chamber of Commerce, Evelyn Vargas. For the children, Reggie Durandese. Okay, hold on, please. Gold Coast Down Syndrome, Sue Davis Killian. Guatemalan Maya Center, Mariana Blanco. Present online. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Maria Antunia. Hispanic Education Coalition of Palm Beach County, Hector Pedra. Online. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, NAACP, Diedrich Strawn. Palm Beach County Council of PTAs, Charmaine Postal. Present in the room. Palm Beach County Council of PTAs, Marcus Brown. Uh, Marcus told me he may be running a little bit late, so he may jump on soon. Uh, Palm Beach County Human Rights Council, Emmy Kinney. Present online. Okay. Tri-City Education Committee, Eddie Rhodes. Present online. And Tri-City Education Committee, Mary Evans. 
Urban Lee. Urban Lee. Okay. okay. Urban League of Palm Beach County, Terrence Reed. Present. Thank you. Volunteer Association of America, Woodline Pierre. Volunteer Association of America, Carlene Paul. Classroom Teachers Association, Gordon Longhofer. And Palm Beach County School Administrators Association, Jay Blavitt. Thank you. That concludes attendance. We have a quorum. Uh, Amanda, did you? She, I don't know. She said, "Did you call Amanda?" Amanda Kennedy. She came in maybe after. You just put in the chat box. Kennedy uh, Compass. Good. Yeah, you got her. Okay. Next, next item on the agenda is approval of the February minutes. We would like to have a motion for approval of the minutes. I hope you have the opportunity to read it. They were sent to all of you. Move to approve no necessary corrections. I scanned it. A motion, by a motion for approval. He just did a motion, so we need a oh, second. Oh, the motion we got from Eddie Rhodes? Yes. We need a second. We need a second. Approve for Cassandra I'll Oliver. Second. We got a second from Cassandra Oliver. So, so. Okay. Oh, oh. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes. We'll move to the next item of the agenda. The next item of the agenda public comments. Per speaker, any public comments? There's no one in the room here, and it doesn't look like anybody on my end. So we move forward with the next item? Yes. Okay. Update from the DDEC ad hoc subcommittee. The subcommittee have 50 minutes. Subcommittee representative? Um, the subcommittee has completed its Best foot forward, can you be on mute, please? We're getting feedback. Thank you. Um, the subcommittee completed its work on our recommendation that we um, want to present to DEC and ask the DEC approve it to go to the board. Um, is there any way to get it up on the screen? Because I didn't see it in my email. Yeah. Are you sharing or me to share? Okay, thank you. Yeah, we'll share it. Um, we just want to say that this is our um, initial um, main recommendations, and there are a lot of details that need to be worked out, and we would work with DEC to develop those. We have some points and questions um, under each one of these that we will pr be pursuing if and when we get this approved. And um, it did not go out, so I'm just, I could read it out loud or I could let you all read it um, paragraph by paragraph. The first two paragraphs are our introduction and what we're trying to achieve. Um, I'll let you all look at it. You want to scroll down? Oh. Yes, please. Can you scroll? Put it a little, yeah. The first part is launching a media campaign that um, is going to reflect student voices of successful black male students. The second one is to create a database of both school district and community-based um, 
organizations and um, groups that are responsive and supportive of the successful Black male students um, and making parents and um, school staff aware of these programs and also the students themselves. Um, did we miss part of the one? Can you, can you, oh, wait. Janina, okay. we're down to third bullet. I think we got that. And then um, creating environments in schools that um, help to enhance the sense of belonging and connectedness, connectedness for successful Black male students. Um, and we provided some examples, but we will develop more with the help of DEC. And then um, having a communication between school administrators and successful black male students to foster dialogue, allow the students to present the challenges and the things that are working for them and work with the administration to come up with solutions and making an ongoing process um, so there's continual improvement. And then providing um, professional development to um, starting with administrators um, and then also um, school staff, school-based staff. And um, we are going to use the best practices of teachers who have been identified as successful. And then um, presentations um, would be made to all principals as part of that. And I know that that process has started and it would include, as I said, best practices and hopefully um, would follow up with um, implementation of some of those in the schools. And then um, really focusing on promoting connectedness and sense of belonging for these students because they feel very isolated right now. Um, and then this public campaign will include things like bumper stickers, social media, PSAs, et cetera. And the emphasis is on positive positive affirmations, I see myself, and community-wide narrative for the public. Um, the next one is providing training for administrators on how behavioral health professionals can play a critical role in this process. Um, and I think right now they don't get a lot of training on this and may not be assisting as much as they could. Um, and then the final thing is providing professional development for teachers on creating classroom environments that um, are positive for successful black male students. And we're going to kind of focus on successes that have already existed um, and then try to come up with new um, ideas as well. So that is kind of a nutshell of what we're trying to accomplish. All of these things need to be developed further. And we are suggesting that we're going to recommend that the board recommend these um, items be implemented. And then we want to ensure that um, the DPC is part of the process and providing guidance on it um, as school staff um, works on it. So we're hoping that the board will recommend to the school district leadership um, that they put this into place. So just to set context, we spent a lot of time last meeting going through this and then I asked for some time to meet with the subcommittee, which we met a couple of times to refine these a little bit. Um, and so, I think, Kimberly, you're looking for a motion. Or... Um, I, yes, I'm looking or for a motion. Discussion or question. Question. Yeah. Um, Eddie? Uh, yes. Uh, it's kind of scanning in number two uh, in reference to the community and parents and uh, being available, knowing that this program is available. Yes. Uh, the strategy in doing that, would that be something that you can put in place or something that needs to be put in place or something that the school board will put in place or that's something that the, the program would do? Um, we would have to work with the school board on this um, and reach out, you know, seek um, different organizations that can be on the list. And I think mm -hmm. that Keith can help us and some of the other school district with what is already, already exists within the school district. But yes, um, 
we would help provide guidance on it, but it would be implemented. All of this we're recommending um, would be implemented within the district, working with key staff that would be identified. Right now, we're trying to get it um, recommended by the, well, first DEC to the school board, and then the school board to senior, um, you know, senior staff. Okay. The well, superintendent yeah. and the other key um, people. Yeah, my reason for asking is because so many good programs come into the communities and, and the parents and the communities and the organizations that will help uh, is not aware. So, uh, and, and, and looking at going to the school board, uh, if we had something in place that, that can give them some insight of how it needs to be done uh, uh, and make them privy of what we're trying to do and our plans are as far as getting this to the community and the parents. And I keep saying parents because they're a very important entity, which is left out the loop sometimes. Yes. And and that, to get and to get them involved will be an asset to making this thing happen. You know what I mean? Absolutely, and that is yeah. part of the per uh, a main reason that we have that in there is because yes, parents don't always know about all these resources. Yes, that's that's, um, that's why I mentioned. I'm glad you did that. Thank you. Thank you. And any subcommittee members, feel free to jump in if you want to expand upon or correct anything I say. And you have a hand in here uh, raised, Ms. Postal. Thank you. Through the chair, so question for you. Have we consulted or have we had any conversations with students, um, given that this is a student-led organization or a student-led initiative? Then that's, I guess that's my next question. Is it an initiative? Is it a program? Are we asking, based on what I see, look like we're asking some things of the school district. Is it to be embedded? Is it to launch new programs? But my main question was, have we included students? Um, because oftentimes we're talking about students, what we're going to do for students without them. So have we included the students in this specific? Yes, Dr. Corbin Thaddeus. Yes. Um, that's, that's the foundation of this. So that's even how this conversation got started because um, the research with students directly with specifically not just students, but with um, high academic achieving black male students. And that's where, that's the foundation and um, the spirit, that's where the spirit of this comes from. Um, it was Dr. Corbin Thaddeus' research that initiated this. Um, we heard her presentation and then we said, how can we um, take these uh, recommendations and what the students said and create something within the district that supports them? Uh, to your to your um, follow up questions there, um, Charmaine, I think it was um, if this is an initiative, is in a program. Um, I'm not. I don't think that we landed specifically. Um, I, I don't think we landed specifically on if it's a. It's not. A, it's not a program. I would say, um, but I think these are activities that we feel um, could continue to promote um, the success and um, and and. So, the success and to support um, these students to continue to thrive um, in environments that um, really support them to do so. So I think these are um, activities um, more so than initiatives, um, but um, I'm open to others thoughts on that. I think if we had a motion um, on the table, it might help kind of think through. Okay. I think the motion would come from the committee because from the, the committee. yeah, because if it comes from the committee, there's no second because it's coming from a committee. Right. I'm going to quickly just questions. address more on the question. Point. Everything on here is addressing what the black male students who are interviewed, uh, successful black male students, um, stated they needed. So we were trying to address each one of those and things that were working for them. We want to promote those throughout the district. So. Every single point we have here is addressing things that they brought up. Now I'll allow anybody who wants to to um, submit a mo motion. Okay, I'll make a motion. Um, I motion that the DDEC recommends that the school board and district leadership collaborate with DDEC 
to bring awareness to the high academic achievement of Black male students throughout Palm Beach County um, and provide solutions that will cultivate and maintain their success, specifically focusing on inclusivity, respect, and empathy. Is there a second? I second the motion. There's no second needed. It's coming from committee. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Um, is there any discussion? We have a uh, Dr. Robinson. And then we have Ms. Oliver. Yes, thank you. I'd like to offer a friendly amendment to that motion uh, to clarify that the request is that the school district, the school, I don't know if you said board or district, but that school district staff uh, be directed to work with DDEC to implement these recommendations. Because the way I heard the motion, it it they, it could have been interpreted as they need to come up with a plan to address inclusivity and so forth. So I'm just trying to clarify because we the committee put a lot of work into this. Mm -hmm. Do we need to restate the um, Do we meet, the motion you, with the friendly amendment? You're going to need a, a second to the to the okay. amendment and then a vote on the amendment if it's supported. So right now, Dr. Robinson put a, a friendly amendment, a motion for a friendly amendment. To the committee's motion. So we need a second to that. Um, I'll second that. Just don't ask me to restate it. <laughs> I know. So well, okay. Dr. Robinson can, okay, so can we vote on it then? I, 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 yeah. Well, I think you want to repeat that, Dr. Robinson. You have to repeat for the record. Yeah, Dr. Robinson, can you repeat? Can you repeat your amendment, please? So it it wasn't the full amendment. I was just trying to clarify that. Um, in my mind, the the motion should be that we are DDEC is asking. Okay, let me see if I can get it together. So asking um, the board to direct staff to work with DDEC to implement these recommendations. Do the check. Okay, so the DDEC recommends that the school board and district leadership and staff work with... No, they're going to direct staff. Oh, through the chair, can we post the original motion and maybe that will help us clear up what yeah. Dr. Robinson is saying? Okay. Um, maybe All right, let chat. me. Can you, can you can type, we type it, it in the chat? In the chat? Yeah, let me. I'll drop it here. Okay, stop sharing. Let me share. I'm gonna share. I, just, I just dropped it in the chat. I think so. Okay, it's in the chat. So, what I'm, what I'm trying to clarify in my memo is that the school board and district leadership will direct other staff to work with us. Unless you're saying that you really want the school board and the superintendent and the chief of this and chief of that to sit with DDEC on this. Because Okay, I am changing. The DDEC recommends that the school board direct district leadership and staff to collaborate with the DDEC to bring awareness to the high academic achievement of black male students. Let me go down. <coughs> throughout the Palm Beach County, I would say school district. Okay, I think I got the Amend the friendly amendment in the chat. If you can see if that is correct. But it's not to provide solutions. It's to implement the solutions that are being provided by this subcommittee. Right. That's really the part I was pushing back on. I think the language mm -hmm. about district leadership and school board collaborating is um, like 
like the commercial. That's just not how it works, you know. <laughs> okay. I am trying to fix that. So amend the provide solutions. We don't. We don't. We want them to take the solutions that we have and move them forward. Im implement the recommendations. Correct. I'm working on it. I think I've got it. Wait, I'm not the best typist. Okay, how's this? We'll get rid of the two. Oops, let me fix that again. Okay, now try that. Wait, I thought it didn't take. Is that what's in there, Dr. Robinson, that she wrote, is that? Okay, hang on, let me catch up, please. The only thing I would suggest is probably after the word recommendations, I would put of the DDEC. It's not letting me change it, I don't think, wait. Right, because you're talking about the recommendations that the subcommittee came up with. Yeah. Correct? Yes. Yes. Okay, let me. You got it? You want me to do it? I, I'm doing it right now. Okay. Implement the recommendations provided by DDEC. Yes. That's what we're adding up here. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Turn out okay. Okay, it's the very bottom one. So, so there's a motion, uh, a I'm friendly sorry. amendment, motion, and second. You still need a vote yeah. now on this amendment, friendly amendment. Um, one more, one more. I'm sorry, one more thing. Um, I, and I, I don't mean to turn everything upside down, but uh, the last sentence. I'm just looking at this, and it, um, it doesn't for me connect back now. I just thought about this. So specifically focusing on so the very last sentence, right, where it says cultivate and maintain their success, specifically focusing on, and it, I'd, I'd like it to read, we can keep the other, the, the three that are there somewhere, but I'd like it to read focusing on connection, belonging, and trust. Because that's where, that's where we um, have, that, that's where we kind of started to make sure that this was embedded. So you have a friendly amendment um, that's yes, currently on the table. So, so you need an amendment to the friendly amendment. Yeah, I, I, Unless Dr. Yes. Robinson wants to continue to fix her friendly amendment. You only can have one? I don't know. Was you can do another one. I'm just trying to keep it straight. Okay. Did Dr. Robinson, is, has yours been addressed? No, I, can I? Or she could withdraw. You could withdraw yours. The amendment failed for lack of a second and start again. Because there I was a second, Miss Cassandra. Rules in just a second. Doctor, that is a second that your amendment. Yeah, Robinson. I did. Uh -oh. the, first, okay. the funny amendment was second. Go ahead. I'm gonna accept whatever she says. Go for Are it. You? So the sec. So Doctor Robinson's friendly amendment should have been accepted because I seconded. Correct. It is. Okay. So Anyone she could withdraw. Pause? She could withdraw it. Uh -uh. And leave. Okay. So then we need to vote on the current, and then you can go ahead and offer another friendly amendment. Sorry. Yeah. So we need to vote on the, the friendly amendment. Okay. Anyone? Those voting. Are, those voting on favor. Of the friendly amendment. Of the friendly of the front amendment. 
Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Nay. So it passes with. So it passed with because, one. Yeah. With one two to one. one. Three to one. Or with one. One in dissent. Well, one. Mm. Undecided. No one. On, on one. In, opposed. One, one opposed. Right. So it passes with one opposed. Now, we're back to the original amendment, which is what's in the last piece in the chat box. Okay, now, um, is there another motion for a friendly amendment? But, Cassandra, yes. I don't think you, Dr. Thaddeus, yes. I don't think you can make a friendly amendment since you're the original oh. okay. motion. Okay. Because you made the original motion? The original motion didn't come from yeah. her, it came from committee. So she would be able to. It would come from committee, it didn't come from anybody in particular, it came from the ad hoc subcommittee. I think I'm the only one that can't make the motion. Anyone can make the motion. The original motion came from um, the motion as presented by the ad hoc committee. It was not from anyone in particular. It came directly from committee. So this motion, and even if you so did make a motion, amendment. she so can so, make a motion, yeah, correct. Right. Okay, so go ahead, Dr. Thaddeus. All right, um, so I would like to make a friendly amendment um, to the motion on the table to read um, the same, except for the last three words. I'd like them to read instead, connection, belonging, and trust. Do we have a second? Okay. Second. Any a second. Are you uh, capturing that, Kim? Um, yes. Oh, let me to be post second. it. Okay. It has been second, so let's just retype it in there. If you look at the very bottom, I retyped it. Okay. Are there any okay. discussions? Yes. Ms. Cassandra? I know we had several discussion moments last meeting, but I don't recall, please refresh my memory, what was the timeline for this to get to the board and what we're expecting for resolutions or getting onto agenda items from the board? What is the expectation there? The, the so, next school board meeting is April 17th, I believe. And we, if we approve um, whichever amendment, you know, whichever, if we approve it, it will go at that time. Our uh, D DDEC chair will present it. Motion and to extend time by 10 minutes. Sorry to cut you off. Motion to extend time by 10 minutes on this topic. Second. All in favor? The motion to extend Aye. 10 minutes. Motion to stand. Any opposed? Any opposed? Let's continue. Okay, um, April 17th is where it's when it's going to be presented to the board and the subcommittee plans to meet the follow at the following meeting um, as we do just before the next DDEC meeting, which I believe is on the 24th. So we should get input from the board that we can possibly start implementing and expanding upon the document that you see here. Thank so, you. And that would be presented um, through the chair's report, um, but also in written format, um, probably via email and a hard copy as well. Thank you. Okay, so any other questions? There's a motion and it was seconded, so now we vote because, unless there's more discussion. Any other discussion? Any other discussion? Back to original motion on the floor. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Yay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Dr. Okay. Robinson has her hand up. Yeah, thank you. So I see the Dr. Robinson, board member, please. Um, 
the school board member that is the liaison to this committee is on the in the meeting. Um, we have done this before, where we asked the school board member to like bring it up as a discussion item. And so my question um, is if the school board member is willing to do that. So then it could be that the recommendation comes from the DDD, DDEC chair at the beginning of the meeting, right? And then at the end of the meeting, the board member is championing, championing this. Are you saying during committee reports? No, I'm saying board discussion items at the end of the meeting. So it would be bookend. It would be it would come under committee report at the beginning of the meeting. Oh. And, but then the board member who is the liaison here, Mr. Ferguson, could circle back and bring it up as discussion. So it's not hanging in the wind as a committee suggestion. Okay. And then the board members can discuss it. And I'm you know, I'm working on the assumption that the board members would say, yeah, and kind of direct the superintendent to have staff work with DDEC on how this could be implemented. Because each one of those steps, you know, we said has to have further conversation on how to get it done. Like that we weren't just going to recommend it and walk away. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we need to make a motion on that, or do we just add? No, the, Mr. Ferguson is on the call. Mr. Ferguson? It's, it's, she's asking Mr. Ferguson to put it on as a discussion item at the end. If he's willing to do that. Yeah, Hold on a second. I'm here. Hello? Okay. Yes. Did you hear the discussion? I did. You asked me to make sure that we put it on as a discussion item, so I'll, I'll get with um, Mr. Oswald to make sure I have the proper language or what have you. Um, that won't be a problem. Great, thank okay. you. Thank and you. in that way, it'll be bookend, so it's not just the committee, but it's also the board. And then the and then the superintendent will be looking to see if any board members have any pushback when um, when the board member brings it up. And if there's none, then you would expect it to, you know, move forward. Okay, sounds good. All right, All right. So we move um, on the agenda with the next item. Update from Chief of Equity and Wellness, Mr. Oswald. So I'm going to defer that time so that we have time for um, right now for the new business for the presentations as well as the presentation on classic learning test and an update on the Stronger Connections grant. So, so we're going to move to the next one, the Guatemala Mayan Center, Ms. Mariana Blanco. Okay, yes. Uh, one, one moment, thank you. Uh, Keith, will you be pulling up the presentation? Um, yeah. Uh, I, have it from last, I have that one from last month, right? Mariana Blanco's presentation? Yeah, I know. Yeah, give me one second. She did. Okay, Ms. Blanco, here we go. Okay, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. So uh, my name is Mari Blanco. I'm the Assistant Director at the Guatemala Mind Center. Um, and I'll just be quickly going through some of the services that we provide. So just quickly, our center has was founded officially incorporated in 1992. Um, Father Frank, our founder and executive director, has been doing this work long before then. And when we initially started uh, the center, we began doing prenatal care 
the NICU at St. Mary's was completely overwhelmed with uh, premature babies, primarily indigenous Maya babies. They didn't know how to navigate the health care of those women. And um, so that's, that's kind of how the birth of the center started, um, uh, navigating the culture and the language barriers that the women were having um, at the hospital. And so since then, our work has um, evolved based on the needs of the people. That's something that we are really proud of. Our services always are constantly changing um, based on what we hear that the community needs or that the community needs more support in. The building that is um, on the screen is a brand new building that we are operating in. We have for a long time operated in very small areas and we were lucky last year to be able to move into this new area. So we're directly across from Lakewood High School now. And so then some, some of our services that we provide at the center, and these are just some of our set programs, but um, there's a lot of other stuff that we work on throughout the years, depending on uh, the, the need of, or the focus for that year. But I'll start with uh, our set programs. Our Parent Child Plus program is a program that we have. It's funded by Children's Services Council, and it is um, for early literacy for starting at two years old, a case manager navigates them all the way through four years old, making sure that those two year olds or those children are meeting um, all of their uh, early developmental stages. And if there's need to intervene at an early age, we could do that. Um, and each parent is matched with a case manager that would speak the language of the home and, um, and that would you know, have this, the same culture of the home. We also have our Escuelita Mayas. Our Escuelita Mayas, how I got involved in as a volunteer when I was 15. They are our after school programs for um, school age children, elementary age children. They operate currently, one is at Highland Elementary, the other one is at Our Savior Lutheran. And um, primarily we serve children of day laborers, children of farm workers. Um, those programs uh, are very low cost. They're our only program that has a cost um, at the Guanamomai Center, but, but we always try to work with parents in the event that they can't afford to pay. So lately we have been um, accepting a lot of the, the children of um, some of our survivors of domestic violence. If we're, if we're working with a person that's dealing with a domestic situation at home, we certainly want to make sure that they have childcare in order to um, go to work. So that that's kind of the, the, a purpose of the Escuelita Mayas, and we try to serve as the bridge between the parents and the children there. Um, so while they are after school programs, they're open year round, and um, we operate full time uh, spring breaks or any time that the school district is closed to make sure that those children have um, have care while their parents are at work. Our outreach program is our most random program. It's our program that's not really funded by anyone, and we do that on purpose to make sure that um, we don't have limitations on the work that that team could do. Between the three of our outreach case managers, uh, they see over a thousand people a month and they do anything that the people need at the time um, that they come access our services. So a lot of, a lot of what they do is um, DCF access. So helping with Medicaid and, um, and food stamp applications, but also uh, if there's a victim of domestic violence, uh, wage theft, um, if they have any issues with the school district and they need us to intervene, um, we do that there, cultural interpretation, accompaniment to court. Um, so that team is really flexible to do whatever it is, like home visits, anything that the community asks us to do, our outreach team would be the first to know and, and could direct to, to the appropriate service. Um, from there, we have a food pantry. It's open to anyone. Um, all of our services, I should say, are open to anyone, but our food pantry opened as a direct response to the pandemic in uh, 2020. Unfortunately, we have seen food insecurity and the need for food grow, and so we operate every Tuesday and Friday uh, in the mornings. Anybody's welcome to come starting at 9 until the food finishes. We recently opened our Clinica Maya. Our Clinica Maya is uh, a free clinic for uninsured folks. We are partnered with a lot of different agencies to help navigate women's health. Um, uh, we navigate a lot of the farm workers who typically don't have access to healthcare. 
um, or just anybody who really needs the services. We have been providing school vaccinations on site every Tuesday uh, with an appointment. So we do a lot of that work at the Clinica Maya. And one of the things that we really tried to bring into this uh, clinic, knowing that access to healthcare is something that's incredibly important for our community, but that there's still a lot of mistrust with health agencies. Um, we are really trying to bring that traditional medicine along with the Western medicine to make sure that our, our folks have a full uh, level of care and that they feel comfortable accessing that full level of care. And then just other informal stuff, we do a lot of advocacy work uh, wherever it's needed, missing persons. We work with the local uh, sheriff's department to find missing persons in the area. We do family reunification. So for the school district, that means um, all of the unaccompanied minors, we can help those parents navigate the process of um, sponsoring a child if they're looking to bring one of their children. Translations in the indigenous languages, we do carry Mambokti, Acateco, and Canjobal in our, um, in our, in, at home. And then we also obviously do court assistance and any any issue with the school with the school district that a parent might be having. We serve really anybody who walks through our doors. Currently, we're serving uh, people from twenty eight different countries. Um, most of our uh, population, we are the home to recent arrival migrant families because we um, recognize that typically those folks don't qualify for a lot of other services or they have a hard time navigating other services. A lot of our uh, population is primarily non-English speakers. Um, and while anybody can come and access services through us, we are a home for the indigenous Maya. And then I don't need to talk about the barriers the population faces. I mean, a lot of our students, you all know, um, especially if there are recent arrivals, they they will uh, face issues with cultural competence amongst uh, some of their their classmates or um, even with staff members, language barriers. If they're coming from a country that doesn't speak um, English, that's a big big problem. And then accessing healthcare, even accessing just regular forms. I know we have the Welcome Center. We're trying to work with them as well right now and uh, the multicultural department to make sure that um, folks are really understanding the services that each one of us provides so we can, um, you know, so we can support the families in, in a culturally competent way. But I'm sure everybody here knows the barriers or population faces. So you can, you can move forward, Keith. And so then this is just um, our contact information, how to contact us. Um, you can always contact me. I will also uh, write our my assistance number in the, um, in the chat if you have a, a high need case. But we do a lot of um, different advocacy work. So last year we focused uh, something that was an issue to all of us and to the school district with kids um, not going to school or missing school was SB 1718. We're seeing a lot of those things also happen. And so know your rights, classes, power of attorneys. If a, if a parent needs a power of attorney, we can help them access that very, very easily. So you can always connect with me. Our info email is ran by our admin staff as well. You can connect through there and I will write our um, assistance uh, information also on the chat. Uh, and the, our our contact information will be the most direct way of getting in touch with us. And that's it. That's all I got for you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Mariana Blanco. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> all right. Moving with the agenda, the next item is the Volunteer Association of Florida, Carlene Paul. Um. I don't know if it's morning or afternoon at this time. My name is Colleen Paul. I am a board member of the Volunteer Association in Funds of Florida, and I'm looking forward to do my presentation if Dr. Oswell will yes, we'll, uh, <laughs> help me with the, present, the slide presentation. Yay. <laughs> to the presentation mode. 
Yeah. Okay, are we ready? Yes. Okay. The Volunteer Association in front of Florida's information where you can contact us. We are located in the great city of Delray Beach. Um, you can move to the next slide. Pichai. Just want to go. Yeah. Okay. The Volunteer Association in Florence of Florida was founded in 2011 by Mr. Carlson Zomer. He served as a volunteer patrol police partner and saw the needs for more representation in Delray Beach in the Haitian American community. He created an organization that advocate for Haitian American in Palm Beach and its needs. Joint forces with community organizations such as SEIU, New Florida Majority, now known as Florida Rising, these connections created pathways to connect with unity, uh, unify of Palm Beach County, the SET Neighborhood Alliance in Delray Beach, just to name a few. We are everywhere in order to connect the African American community and the Haitian American community using the resources that are available. And one of the biggest problem is the language barrier. And this is the importance when our partners uh, come across Haitian Americans in needs, they refer them to us. So we are grateful to have an array of organization that oversees and concern. Yesterday, we had a press conference about the issues in Haiti, and we were there. Our organization was represented because we truly believe that politics play a very big role in the lives of Haitians living in the United States and abroad. Uh, we'll move to the next slides, please. Uh, it's a picture of our partners. Um, to the right, we have Ms. Deborah. Ms. Deborah is a voter registration icon. She's a guru. I mean, she's next to you. She will register you at 17 years old and tell you they will send it to you when you turn 18. And the others are members of the SET Alliance. We also have Miss Anne here from Florida Rising and many others. We can move on to the next picture. Our core values, next. Uh, we believe in putting our community first. And when we say our community, we talk about the needs of black immigrants, uh, brown people, Haitian people, but the fact that we have a language barrier and the Haitian people need a place to go to where they can communicate in their native language what their needs are. Sometimes I remember working in Salisbury, Maryland with Haitian migrants, and I was doing translation at a clinic for these Haitian migrants who were picking cucumbers and tomatoes when I was a college student. And one of the doctors told me, teach, how are you going to say, um, how are you going to say, I'm going to call vote? There are certain expressions that they give you in growing up in America and not accustomed to these uh, uh, words. If you try to do direct translation, the doctor is in trouble. So um, it's, it's, it's important that we have a, an organization that can understand the roots of the people. And this is what the Volunteer Association is fighting for because we see the needs. With what's happening in Haiti, there's a great number of immigrants that are coming all over South Florida. I'm flying to New York on the 13th to go to a town hall meeting about the situation of Haitians in Haiti that are migrating. And the mayor of New York said, I can't take anymore. You know? And it's not just Haitian. It's all Latin American immigrants. So um, we, we stand uh, for uh, every American right to have their voices heard through their vote. We educate our community through a monthly people assembly meeting. 
our weekly radio show, along with our activism during election cycle, which is right now. This is election time. <laughs> and we know our vote counts. This is why we got together with the African American and called it One Black, because we are putting our vote together. And when we do that, it, makes, it's, it becomes powerful. So we're trying to work with our partners on all level in order to find results for our community. The next slide, please. Our mission. We are a not-for-profit 501c3 Haitian American organization. We are dedicated to empowering, mobilizing, educating, and preparing community leaders to share their values and maximize their voting power in, in, in civic engagement. We aim to address social, educational, and economical inequities that our community faces every day. Next slide, please. This is a picture of us in the community. And you can see my beautiful face. You can't miss my glasses. And, 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 and the team of Haitian, we are all volunteer. We do not get paid for what we do. And we are a lot. And we, you know what we do? We, we schedule our time. You go into the office, there's somebody that needs something, it must be done in the office. Are we gonna take them to this office in order for them to find the resources? These are the people that stand together behind Volunteer Association. Thank you, team. <laughs> uh, our stakeholders, uh, we, find, we fight for our children and our elderly. We advocate for Haitian in Palm Beach County, both existing and newcomers. And, and the needs is very, very great for the new immigrants that are coming. And we speak up for the disenfranchised and the forgotten voices. That's what we do at Volunteer Association. Everywhere we go, we have a mic, we go to school board meeting, we go to community uh, uh, meeting, we do everything in order to answer the need of the Haitian American community. And being part of this board uh, brings us, uh, give us a platform to let the community understand that the school system is willing to work with different organization. And when you go to a school, there's an approach for you to have with the principal of that school. Uh, 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 you catch more bees with honeys. So these are some of the work that we are doing at the Volunteer Association. Next slide, please. These are some of the pictures. You see our youth, uh, they go out, they canvass. They were supporting uh, the great Biden in the, in the 2020 election. And Florida Rising is a nonpartisan 501c3 organization that does a lot of advocacy for issues such as housing uh, and, 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 and children rights, uh, uh, reproductive rights, and we travel with them all over the state of Florida in order to get our word across. And we have millions of people that marches. We go to Tallahassee on uh, 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 well, in Miami, it used to be Day Day. Now we call it Palm Beach Day, <laughs> you know? So this is some of the pictures that we're sharing with you. Next slide, please. Okay, some of the activities that um, we get involved in the community, it's very popular. Thanksgiving giveaway, senior appreciation dinner that we do every year and the Christmas storage drive. These things are things that connect us. They will call us on the radio, Teacher Colleen, when are they giving the turkeys? Uh, uh, Teacher Colleen, when are they giving the toys? So we always give them a date, and then they look forward to the date, and they bring toys too. They, we have boxes, they deposit one or two toys, and we have organization that donates a whole lot of toys and turkeys to us, but it's never enough. So um, wherever we find help, remember the Volunteer Association, we are there. Key, um, we talked about that already, key program initiatives, um, getting involved with the re-election campaign for, the, we, we're talking about a significant achievement that have made an impact with uh, the organization. When we got involved with the re-election campaign of Dr. Deborah Robinson, 
our support for her campaign, solidify the ongoing relationship with the Haitian community, and assured her a win. Though this newfound partnership with Dr. Deborah Robinson helped us achieve one of our greatest dream, the installation of the Haitian Creole Dual Language Program in the Palm Beach County School Board. Ladies and gentlemen, now we are three and going. And I want you all guys to know that our present school board member, Edwin Ferguson, continued in working with us so we can have more programs. And I want to thank everybody in the school system. With the help of Dr. Robinson, everybody came together. And it's, you're going to see. Next slide. I don't want to talk anymore. Uh, uh, where it is? First program started in Rolling Green Elementary in Boynton Beach. Three elementary school in Palm Beach now has the program implementation into all subject rotating program within elementary student. That's where we are today. Where is it going? Integrated as a full dual language program, provide choice option at school district level, expand in more school, particular Pine Grove Elementary and Village Academy, Delray Beach. We are working on these two. And, and, and school board member Ferguson is helping us, and we got it, and the community want it. And we know with the support of the school board, we will get it. What we want to see, how much teachers with Haitian Creole competency in the program, hire more Haitian staff, provide continuous professional development training, increase resources, and create additional exposure. I got to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, when I just came to Palm Beach and came to our first board meeting, parents were calling me because I spent 31 years on Haitian radio in Miami-Dade. And I came to Palm Beach County, and I'm like, we got to build up the Palm Beach Haitian American community, just like I did in Miami-Dade. And I went to a few schools. Uh, the people were lost. When they arrived, they didn't have anybody to talk to in their native tongue. And I educated them. I came to the school board meeting. And I'm proud to say there's not one school that I go to today that do not have somebody at the front door that can speak Creole with these Asians. Our work is great. It's working. And the school board is listening. I am very proud. We invited the superintendent at our radio show. He came. So there is a great relationship between the Haitian community and the school system. But we also educating the parents on an everyday basis how to approach people. We tell them they don't know how to read the code of conduct. So we are taking that responsibility little by little to teach them this information. This is why our goal is to get a center in Palm Beach County with the name of Haitian American Resource Center. Volunteer Association in front of Florida. We will not stop until we get that. Next slide, please. You're doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> I got to give you are too. <laughs> uh, uh, play, 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 play this little clip and listen to this. <clears throat> I was a drama major in college, guys, so I, 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 I got to put life into it, you know? <laughs> in Florida, our Josie Car um, Rolling Green Rolling Elementary. Elementary. Our state has a large, large Haitian, Haitian population, population, and so, so this so program will serve a lot of a students, lot of students that go to this school. school. Now, the way that it works is students, students will be in a classroom where teachers are teachers are teachers are in select group of kindergartners at Rolling Green Elementary in Boynton Beach are taking their education oh, on, to the next level. Is there this is, is that a better idea? Is this one being presented to mm -hmm. is this the one that's on the oh, on the screen? Google yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. 
native or Trying to work on a way to better share that. So Yeah, just give me a second. I'm just in another. Okay, Jonathan, I sent it over to you. Technology. Yeah. And it's slide 17 when it, yeah. it refreshes. It would be in the inbox as it sounds, but there's a big file. So. Jonathan, if you want to keep looking for it, we'll play it maybe at the end and let... Yeah. Um, he can work on it. Okay. He can work uh, on Ms. Paul it. finish. It's, it's okay, so uh, go to... Slide 70. So we'll, we'll come back to that yeah. video, so we'll go to 18? Yeah, exactly. No, we're going to go to 17. Did we do due process for Haitian students? Yeah, that's where we're at now. Okay. So... Um, Haitian families felt belittled and undermined by school personnel. And what we meant by that, these are things that happened in the past. And this is why I say this partnership and working with the parents and educating them on the radio, uh, we have seen changes. Parents were not provided proper assistance with language services. Again, like I said, it's, it's, it's a thing of the past. The verbal and nonverbal. Well, I think he's got it, so I'm sorry to interrupt you. Okay. I apologize. Um, okay, we can, we can show. It's a one-minute um, uh, news clip that came out with the great work that we did on the opening, on the opening day of um, this great program. Jonathan, it's not coming up on uh, Google Meet. You might have to stop presenting. I did. There you go. Okay. 
Okay, yeah. cross-cultural education program in Boynton Beach. Some kindergartners are getting classroom instruction in English and Haitian Creole. This is the first of its kind in Florida. Our Josie Carbonari got an exclusive look at Rolling Green Elementary. Our state has a large Haitian population, and so this program will serve a lot of students that go to this school. Now, the way that it works is students will be in a classroom where teachers are teaching in both English and Haitian Creole. A select group of kindergarteners at Rolling Green Elementary in Boynton Beach are taking their education to the next level. Ah, ah, that's it. It's a first-of-its-kind program in the state. The school district of Palm Beach County offering dual language learning in English and Haitian Creole. This is kind of groundbreaking for us. According to the district, 9,500 students in Palm Beach County identify as Haitian Creole as their native or home language. Superintendent Mike Burke says the program will allow students to attain high levels of academic achievement and develop cross-cultural competence. Well, I think that's it because um, we did not want to make it too long, but we wanted to show you that it was highlighted in the media. And one good thing, since this program, the principal has invited the volunteer association to every single activities that is going on. And we make sure one of our members, either board member or volunteer of the organization that love what we do are present at these activities. So I want to tell you that uh, thank you, Dr. Robinson, and thank you, uh, school board member Ferguson, that is continuing in the struggle with us. Now let's go back to, let's continue to page 18 with civic engagement. Uh, the, the civic engagement. The Volunteer Association has worked directly with local and state organizations to advocate for the rights of black and brown people in Florida. We have addressed the Florida House of Representatives, held press conference, and march for our rights. We work diligently to register more eligible citizens to participate in the political process. We are dedicated to continue our work with the current board members and staff of the public school system to continue the implement, to implement positive changes for our students and their families. And the next picture is a picture of us participating in an activity. And of course, teacher Colleen is in the picture with the <laughs> pants with the stripe. Uh, so uh, that was May, May 18, celebrating Haitian Flag Day. We went from cities to cities to cities that day. I was ex ex exhausted and um, it was a great day for the Haitian American community where we saw flags, Haitian flags in different cities were risen, were rose, and people were excited. And, and, and the kids, parents were driving by because they felt that they were part of the community. So Florida Rising was involved in all of these connections to make that day such an important thing. That's pictures with Florida Vi uh, Rising and Volunteer Association at conferences that I tell you they pay for us. We go, we learn, we come back, we advocate, and um, we do a lot of work in the community. Partnership. Our partnership we're moving to partnership. Our partnership organization, like I mentioned earlier, SEIU, Florida Rising, Unify, uh, Palm Beach County, the SET Neighborhood Alliance, to name a few, because we have a lot more organization that we work with. But I was giving a limit to talk. Uh, Susan say no more than 20 minutes maximum. And, and, and the video took 10 minutes. Uh, collaboration, Feeding South Florida, we work with them. Eat Better, Leave Better. It's an organization that helps feed people. Delray Beach Firefighters, they came and did uh, work with us during the pandemic where they gave uh, uh, um, uh, 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 kits to the community. Vice uh, 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 V Medical Center also is a medical center that work with the community community that we work with, VIP, Integrative Healthcare, that's Dr. Martin, one of our board members. That's just to name a few. And community partnership, uh, we have Captain Coleman. He was a f former uh, a Delray 
uh, Assistant Chief Volunteer, recognize, we recognize Captain Coleman in Lake Worth um, uh, because of his dedication to the Haitian American community and the community at large. Uh, we did a press conference where we organized uh, to speak against Governor DeSantis' support for Bill 1718, which affect immigrants. So we, we get in there. We get political. And we get people elected, and we get people out of office, too. <laughs> Haitian Appreciation Day, we worked on that because uh, we have to show people that volunteer, we appreciate them. So after we worked diligently in the community, we came together with Commissioner Mark Bernard, Senator Bobby Powell, Attorney Al Jacket, and members of law enforcement for a special appreciation dinner on May 2023. So we are there, we are moving, we are hot, and we want to be hotter with the school board this particular uh, um, year coming. What we'd like to see, more cooperation with our association to implement changes, see better treatment for Haitian families from current administration, increase funding for programs and resources to support Haitian American student as partner to promote family involvement. And you can tell us how to do that uh, 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 so we can, you know, increase funding. That's important to us. Uh, we, we're the little kid that don't understand the process yet. So get us in there. <laughs> Include more Haitian American in administrative position through the school district. Install a Haitian Caribbean Resource Center in Palm Beach County. That's our dream and partner with, district, with the district to promote programs and to educate the community through Haitian media. Having said that, I yield the balance of my time. Does anybody <laughs> have any question for us? Thank you. <laughs> Merci. Merci. <laughs> thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thank you. We can, <laughs> any question? I got one. Is there an event happening on the 30th with your organization? On, on, on the 30th of this month? Yes, because like you said you had a press conference yesterday. And yeah, then and then there's a march. Yeah, there's a march on the 30th. And, and, and they're demanding certain things that I'm not too crazy about. The first two things, but the rest of the stuff we agree on. <laughs> and that's where I'm going. <laughs> Any other question? Any other questions? Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Nice job. Both organizations, again, just a reminder that we're here to, you know, learn about each other's organizations, to be able to collaborate and leverage each other's resources, and the reason why we're going through each of these. So, nice Next one is going to be Classical Learning Tests by Paul Hawkins. Paul, thank you for being on today. You uh, no problem, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I will me go to share ahead and or are you going to share? I'll share. Okay. Or at least I'll try. <laughs> okay. Good luck. <laughs> all right. So you all should be able to see that. Uh, classical learning test. Yes. Kind of just a brief update. Um, so, uh, as you probably know, the state approved the use of the classical learning test for um, concordance scores, bright futures, a couple other things, uh, college admissions um, in Florida schools uh, late during the summer. Um, many of our schools started working on that in the fall, uh, you know, providing another opportunity uh, for students to make a, a concordance score to graduate. Um, you know, if they're not able to meet the score on the FSA or the FAST. Um, so what we've done, basically, you know, the, the students can take it on their own just the same way they would a Saturday SAT or ACT. Um, schools and the district just recently um, have offered kind of a school day administration, somewhat like we do for SAT. Um, but, you know, there's, there, students are able to do this on their own as well. And, you know, as such, you know, it being a state accepted assessment and all of those pieces, you know, that, that test is being used by students and schools and a district administration uh, just recently for concordance. 
Um, we're still kind of learning the test because it is relatively small and relatively new in anything other than small uh, private schools and home ed fields. But, uh, you know, we're working with the organization to, um, you know, provide the best opportunities for our students to take these assessments. Uh, looking at it kind of compare, and if anybody has any questions, just speak up because I can't see you um, with the, the presentation going. Um, but just kind of a, a quick comparison of the three options we really have for concordance testing, um, you know, ACT, SAT, and CLT, uh, you know, cost breakdown, you know, when the student purchases the test on their own, it's roughly the same, very similar pricing. Um, all three organizations offer fee waivers for students, um, you know, through their own application process if they're doing it on their own. They also provide discounts, um, you know, for district administrations. As you can see, the CLT is actually quite a bit uh, less expensive when the district administrations are, are, are going through, uh, particularly compared to SAT. Uh, moving into that third column on the time, uh, you know, it's it's a very similar time structure to ACT. Um, it's a kind of a similar breakdown of the assessment as well, um, where you've kind of got an English and a reading section, a verbal and a grammar section for CLT uh, that are really testing the students' reading and um, you know English abilities, uh, then a math section. Uh, the outlier on the timing piece is really the SAT, in that um, for both the ACT and the CLT, the students can just take the section they need. It's like if I'm a student who needs a concordance score in math, you know, I don't have to spend effort and time on the um, English and reading version or uh, sections of the, the assessment, um, which is something we are running into in terms of frustration for our students who are working towards concordance with SAT is they have to actually sit and work through all of the assessment or all of the sections of the assessment, um, you know, to get that concordance score. Um, for uh, ACT, for the ELA, again, as I mentioned, uh, for ACT and CLT, there's two sections that come together to form that score. Um, for ACT, the, 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 the scoring is for the graduation requirement is based on the average score between those two sections. Uh, essentially a student getting a 17 and a half or better. Um, whereas CLT, they're actually doing the sum of the two section scores. So um, each of the sections on CLT have 40 items, one point of question, very straightforward scoring, um, which is a, a little bit, um, you know, a positive on the understanding side of things. You know, you got 20 out of 40 questions as opposed to working through scale scores um, like ACT and SAT. Um, and then the other really big um, uh, difference, you know, again, it's a 40 item test and the, the concordance score for CLT for, for the math, for the algebra requirement is an 11 out of that 40. Um, so that, that is definitely, um, while that's the concordance scores that have come through the state and vendor studies, you know, that is, you know, in terms of actually number right, uh, lower than the other assessments in terms of that that minimum threshold. Uh, and then again, like I said earlier, they can also be used for bright futures and those scores are are roughly equivalent in terms of um, you know what what they they align to uh, in use for bright futures. Mr. Hutchins, we have a, yes. a question in the room. No, no, it no. was just oh, and sorry. I know when you say it, I'm gonna know what it is, but what is FAS and FMS? Um, that's the academic and the merit. It's the levels of bright futures. Um, the academic is the the, the higher threshold, uh, full so um, Florida bright academic futures, school? and then the the merit is. I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but it's the the, the lower tier of the bright future scholarships. They they have two different sets of thresholds because of the two different layers of bright futures. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm, excuse me. Um, so, uh, you know, when this assessment rolled out, you know, obviously it's not something we had been familiar with prior to this year at all. Um, so our first step was really look, kind of look at it with our, our, our academics lens. Uh, so we, we shared the sample assessment materials with our teaching and learning team and they really looked through it. Um, you know, ELA, the, 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 the classical learning test, you know, their, their kind of theory of action is they're going back to a more classical, and I'm air quoting here, um, education 
uh, to what's going on now, um, whatever that actually means in, in the real world. Uh, but basically, in terms of looking at the items, the, the questions are, are a little bit more straightforward and to the point, not quite as complex or rigorous as what the students are seeing on a FAST or an FSA um, for the reading and the, the, the grammar section. And then for math, uh, the content, it's, well, it's within the uh, instruction. Um, there's a little bit more uh, higher level math on the math test than there is on, say, an SAT or uh, an ACT, uh, you know, some small percentage of items, at least on their sample materials, um, that uh, relate to pre-calculus, um, logic-based uh, number sense items. Um, you know, as this is going through this year being the first year, um, our schools uh, and teaching and learning have kind of been incorporating some of these kind of pieces into those uh, intensive reading courses or the, the algebra recovery uh, uh, concordance focused uh, courses to, to kind of help making to help schools and students use this as a more as a viable option as well. Um, since it's new, obviously, it's the first year it's being built um, into the, the programming right now. So what I'm sure you're all kind of interested in is what does it look like so far? Um, so here's basically the participation and passing results. Um, and when I say passing, I mean for concordance, because uh, that's really kind of the primary focus that we have for this assessment, at least right now. Um, and so you can see overall of the students, um, primary level, pr primarily 11th and 12th graders who have taken CLT so far, uh, roughly 18% of those uh, have met the graduation requirement um, on the reading scores and 48% on the math. And that's the real, the real big disconnect from the SAT and the ACT in terms of uh, that success towards concordance. Uh, you can see also kind of broken down by, by subgroup. Um, also kind of closer in terms of pass rates than... Um, you know, some of the other assessments, was a uh, but, you know, looking at CLT compared to ACT and SAT overall, um, reading is pretty close, uh, you know, in terms of the, the rate at which our students who need concordance scores pass those tests. Um, one of the big pieces is for the SAT, for the seniors needing concordance, though, for the seniors needing concordance who are, you, who are taking SAT based on our historical data, um, only about 10% of those students are hitting it on SAT. And I really do think a lot of that is the frustration aspect of having to sit through all the sections of the test just to get the, to the, get the reading score. Um, but for our seniors taking SAT for concordance scores, the, the success rates roughly 10% as opposed to, you know, 18 to 20 when you look at the other grade levels and um, tests. But again, as I was mentioning earlier, the real, large difference in terms of concordance between the other options in this is the math with the 48 percent of students who have attempted clt making that math concordance score compared to again roughly speaking um 20 percent for the the other options as a sat and act so uh our schools are continuing to you know administer this to to get more students across the, the graduation stage um, and like I say, instructionally speaking, incorporating kind of some more of the, the, you know, CLT focused strategies, um, to those, uh, recovery type courses that are, are being used for students to meet these, these requirements. Um, and that's, that's really it. That's where we are on CLT at the moment. Um, you know, we'll know more as we, um, move into the end of the year in terms of students who are meeting concordance across the board, um, you know, because in terms of timing, you know, we're just now wrapping up, just recently wrapped up the um, the spring school day SAT. So we're still waiting on a lot of those scores to come back. And then we have an ACT for concordance that is being offered in our schools um, in April again. So those students are getting another attempt at that graduation test before before the, the before the end of the school year, and many of our high schools also do summer programs as well, um, and we're in some discussions to incorporate CLT into that. 
uh, as well as some of our schools also offering April CLT administrations in addition to the ACT. So in a nutshell, that's the, that's the, the CLT so far. Um, with that, I'll open it up to questions. I have a question. Question to the chair. Uh, yes, um, you mentioned high school will be having summer school, and this is one of the things that I would like to know and maybe um, be uh, more proactive to the parents about their participation. Children that are not doing well, will there be summer school um, if they are graduating seniors, and will they be able to take? the CLT again in order for them to graduate before graduating time? Um, these are some of the questions that I have. Mm -hmm. And will summer school also be in, in all the schools for students that didn't do well in a few subject area that wants to catch up so they can move to the next grade? So in terms of summer programs, um, many of our high schools offer, I, I believe most, if not all of our high schools offer, um, you know, those summer remedial uh, kind of boot camps for their, their seniors who still need to kind of get out or get that graduation diploma before August 1st. Um, but the, the specifics are run through the schools. Um, you know, we support them when they need to give assessments. But uh Mr. Oswald, you maybe want to have uh, one of the regional officers bring back specifically what they're planning on doing, maybe teaching and learning. Each, I, I know. So the, each of the high schools will have summer school for seniors that have not graduated. So that could be anything from course recovery to test prep, such as CLT, ACT, SAT, um, if that's what they're missing for the concordance score. So we continue. We've been doing that for years, and that will continue. Um, for those. However, uh, some juniors will probably end up attending depending on the school's capacity. Um, typically ninth and 10th grade at school by school depending um, on how many juniors and seniors they have attending. So then for the lower grades, there's no There is. It depends on which grade level. So for example, uh, third grade will definitely have uh, the Summer Reading Academy for any student who does not get a level two or higher um, on the, um, the yeah, state fast. assessment. Uh, fast, thank you. Um, they keep changing so fast. Um, no pun intended. Um, there's also a couple other grade levels that will the district software, I'm trying to remember. I think it's, it's one, two, and four. Say it again. Four. Uh, one, two, and four are definitely they've got programs going. I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure about middle school yet. Middle school will definitely have any student who jump needs start. to progress. They'll definitely have jump start. Jump, yeah, jump start. So students who have been retained two or more times are two years over age, and then uh, mm -hmm. any student who needs uh, similar to credit recovery, but uh, they need to complete to move out, be promoted to. The, the next grade. So the best way for a parent to know whether or not these resources are available uh, is to contact the counselor at the school. Your counselor and your school administration. Yes. In the school administration, okay. Because that's one of the things that I do on my weekly radio show. I have a Palm Beach school council counselor that comes and give advice on the show. That's and great. when he doesn't come, the community cries because he's doing it voluntarily. Sometimes he has a conflict. So I know the volunteer plays a very important role, and we've been emphasizing that to the community. So a lot of people are going to be calling about summer programs. So that's why my question was asked. And I have a question. One is to follow back, um, piggyback on the previous speaker. Um, one is if those parents don't reach out or don't know yet how to reach out, at what point will the schools reach out? Is, do they find out towards the end of the school year when they get the report card? Do they find, when will they find out if their child have to go to um, summer school? Also as students, uh, families are prepping for summer vacation so we can start getting that message out. Well, for, for example, like third grade, FAST results, Paul, do you know when FAST results will be ready? Um, so they'll be, I mean, so for third grade, as the example, there's FAST and then there's some alternate assessments the students would be taking 
um, in May to, if they don't make it based on FAST, make it based on others. But for the elementary programs, I know the, the list of at-risk students have been sh recently shared with the schools. And um, again, I don't have the process off the top of my head because it's run out of teaching and learning, but the communication between the schools and the parents about students who are at risk, I believe if it has not already started is starting shortly um, for the elementary side of things. For the, for the middle and high, um, again, I believe they, they do their communications, again, starting in the next bit because you've got students that are, you know, more and more assuredly behind if they've got some of the, the, the preliminary indicators, you know, in the next couple of weeks, it's, it's, it's the point where it's like you're probably not going to recover this if you haven't recovered it by, you know, mid-April. I would um, say, yeah, again, I would say for secondary, I know from my own experience, typically it'll be towards the end of April with graduations, trying to make those graduation decisions. But it really depends on each student at the secondary level, especially for seniors, on what they're missing. You know, some kids will end up coming every night trying to do credit recovery. Some may not. You know, some are more motivated than others. So some could be literally like an hour before they walk across the stage. So, um it varies at that level, but yeah, as Mr. Hutchins indicated, this elementary they should the school should be beginning communications soon. Okay, and then the other question that I had, well, it kind of ties in the other two questions I had, kind of ties in where we talk about that approach. Like um, I know we have talked about it in this setting before, and in other academic advisory setting where a district approach, and so. We, we saw what you did with aftercare programs. Every, you know, from the district, it is no longer teacher or school by school. It's now the rollout is at the same time for all. This is something also like, hey, maybe start having that preliminary conversation with families. Like this, this is the, by this day, all schools should be mm -hmm. having a preliminary conversation with families. Like, hey, here where you at. If we, you don't get here, this is where you're going. This is what you're going to have to do. But that's just a suggestion. My other question was regards to that. That first slide, I think it was in, um, it was the money slot uh, slide that it was discussing um, the breakdown between the ACT, SET, and CLET. So those, yes, this slide here. Um, for the costs, how are we addressing the needs of those students who possibly can't afford this um, in certain schools? And, you know, how are we addressing that need? Or what, what is the protocol for this? We put a lot so, of funds. It's, kind of, it's, it's twofold. One of the reasons we do the district level administrations is exactly to your point. There are students who, who can't afford to do it on their own. So those district costs are basically when we do it as a district, um, either for like SAT school day where we do all 11th graders and pay for it. Um, we also do ACT, SAT, and now a CLT where all of the students who need it for concordance are funded by the district. And then um, but that's the, what I was excuse me, say. each of the organizations also have a waiver process where like, for example, if a student wanted to take SAT on a Saturday, but qualified under free and reduced uh, lunch, they would be able to get a waiver uh, up to one or two waivers from, you know, that cost by applying through, you know, they apply directly to college board and schools, um, guidance counselors uh, help students fill out those forms so that they can get those, you know, as many waivers as they need or as they're able to get from the vendor. Okay. Uh, paying for these tests should not be a barrier. We've really evolved over the years in this space that any kid who needs it for graduation, we're going to find a funding source to make sure they're taking it. They're the taking schools it. work really hard. It's their graduation rate and they're not going to let a $60 test <laughs> being a, a barrier to the graduation rate. Okay, so all schools should be finding the means to and the resources to address this. The I, district that's has paid for many of them. Okay. And, and, and to the chair, if I understand correctly, there's a fee waiver process, and that fee waiver process, right. according to what I heard, is done through the college board. And for... How, for SAT. College board, the college board's fee waiver process is for the SAT. 
Okay, for Based, NCT. Yeah, they're, they're How about the other tests like the CLR? Current organizations, yes. They all the same. So it's the same different, process. They they should work through a school counselor or school. admin at the school that's to it. help with that. Okay, that's it. That's where we always go back to the on the radio. And what she was talking about, this is the relationship that we want to create with the school system, is to understand these deadlines and date because we are on the radio. I'm on the air Tuesdays and Thursdays. Carlson Zoma is on the air on Fridays. And we have a blog that we do every morning for five minutes on the morning show. So the information, we can pass it. Right. And the community listen to it. Because some people don't connect with the internet and all these funny things. Agreed. Agreed. It's a big barrier. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Sure. Please. Cassandra. Is this option available for the charter schools and alternative schools also, or do they have to come to a traditional campus to take these assessments for the CLT? Um, so the, the charter schools can offer the CLT, yes. We do not pay for them. We don't uh, pay for the charter schools, but the charter schools can offer the CLT. The alternative In the same way that they offer it. SAT and ACT. And they take the um, test? They come here, or do they take over? Yeah. Where to take it. The, 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 charter, the charter schools would have to do pretty much everything on their own, and they're independent. Alternative schools that are district operated, alternative schools, we do it for it, but if they're an alternative charter, they have to figure out their, their own place. You have a question, Dr. Robinson? Question, Dr. Robinson, please. You're on mute. Hi. Um, so I think I want to hold my comments until other people's questions about this are done, because I'm going to go a little bit left with my comments. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Time to go left, Dr. Robinson. Yeah. So, all right. So thank you, Mr. Houghtons, for this um, presentation. You know, okay. I'm really saddened again. Um, when I was on the school board, I eventually stopped going to graduations because I realized that all the children walking across the stage were not prepared equally, right? And I'm clear that that diploma is important and that sometimes it's like, okay, if it's by the hair, my chinny chin chin, Let's get that diploma. I get that. I'm not discounting that effort. What I'm saying is, so look at this, this slide, which says it so clearly. The difference in the score, to use it as a concordance score, whichever test you're talking about, right? Um, the difference between what's needed to use it as a concordance score and what's needed to qualify for bright futures, right? And then if you take that, whatever that thing is, the state university, whatever that chart is that shows like the average accepted scores at the different schools, you know, that would generally, I think, fall a little somewhere in the middle, but closer to bright futures. But my point is this. Okay, I'm trying to find the words to express the depths of my disappointment. Um, but, I, and it's not like I'm trying to point the finger at any individual, but you know what? <clears throat> the system still, still does not work to educate all students. Right. And like we need an overhaul or, or we just need to come clean and say, yeah, well, you know, like we didn't really intend to educate all of them or like or we threw the ball their direction. If they didn't catch it. It's not our fault. Right. Um, but for me, I'm still stuck in that. Maybe it's pie in the sky that. We need to do everything we can 
to prepare every child for a world we can't imagine if we hope for our children and grandchildren to live in a good place. And this is clearly not, and if you take this, this chart and then superimpose the percentage of children of different subgroups who end up requiring the concordance scores to graduate, you know, our expectations are just too low for some children, okay? And, okay, so I'm, I'm going to get off my soapbox now, but I just, this is like painful. This, this is painful. And, and you wonder why you see some of the things you see on the news. You know, in, in my mind, every time you see a crime, it's, it's a manifestation of the failure of the public education system. And, and I, I have, as the young people would say, receipts to show that the school district is sliding backwards. You know, maybe on the coattails of state foolishness. I don't, I, I don't know. But all I'm saying is, for the people on this committee, and I know you care about children, you care about the children you advocate for and, and other people's children, look at this. Look at the two columns on the right. And tell me, do you want your children to earn their high school diploma with the concordance score, or do you want them to reach the academic scholar level for bright futures? And the question is, what is the school district going to do in partnership with community, because I'm clear it has to be partnership, to have each subgroup no longer require the use of the concordance scores. I mean, or or just like change the doggone mission statement. Okay, I I, I I'm I'm done. But okay, one more thing I'm gonna say. And if at any point in time anybody wants to join the coalition for Black Student Achievement and trying to raise expectations for the community, because trust and believe, I'm gonna be showing this data and say at this coalition meeting. Right. Because it just it starkly says what I've been seeing for a long time. But it says it in numbers, which is so much clearer to me. If anybody wants to join the coalition and, and raise their expectations, let me know. And I, I get off my soapbox. But I mean, I'm, I'm I almost want to cry. Um, to the chair. Uh, Dr. Robinson, I'd love to join the coalition. I think we've exchanged numbers. We'll follow up. And and see yep, how anytime. I can I can be part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comment? Any other question? Thank you. We will follow up to the next uh, presentation. Stronger connection grant, Mr. Oswald. Thank you, Mr. Houchins, for for that presentation. Appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Um, real quick, because I know we're out of time, and I have a hard stop at twelve. Um, I do want to share um, and thank you all for your support. I don't know if you recall, but a number of probably almost a year ago, earlier in the year, um, you all supported um, uh, our recommendation for the, the district to go forward with this Stronger Connections Grant. Um, we kind of put a wish list into this grant. You also received this um, earlier today, and it's in, attached to the meeting. Um, so this Stronger Connections grant, we were awarded. So i quite shocked that we were. It's a $3 million grant for the next two and a half years. Um, this is a summary of what the work that will happen within it, within the Stronger Connections grant. Um, it does have a focus on ESE and ELL students, but also addressing uh, chronic absenteeism, as well as the MTSS uh, school-based team process. And then the third piece around this is student voice. So essentially what this will fund, it'll fund um, in each of the regions four positions for case managers to address the chronic absenteeism work. So everything from home visits, 
uh, really problem solving the challenges of why students aren't coming to school. Um, it will fund four positions in each region that will address the fidelity of the school-based team process in our schools. And then it will fund a stipend um, at each of the schools for uh, next year and the year after. Um, a thousand dollar stipend for someone to uh, kind of own to and, and work to lead the student voice initiative from the strategic plan um, and getting more student voice uh, happening on our school campuses um, and lifting that particular voice. So pretty excited. This will go to the board um, on the 17th um, and you are listed as an advisory group, so um, as we go through the next couple years with this grant, we will be bringing this uh, to you to give you updates on how that work is progressing. But I want to thank you for your support in that. Um, we're pretty excited. Um, I can't believe we received it because we kind of did a wish list. So uh, pretty excited that we got that. I have a question. Dr. Thaddeus. Yes, um, thank you. Congratulations. Um, great work to you and the team that put that together. And uh, my question is, Keith, will you be the lead implementer and coordinator of this grant? So it's, uh, yeah, so I'm one of the leads. I'm part with Kevin McCormick will also be part of it, uh, director of ESC. So on uh, Dr. Sheffield, Mr. Tierney side of the house. Um, on the student voice, I'll be directly over that piece as well as the truancy piece. Um, I, I had a question. Uh, the schools have been identified and we're going to use it. Is your, is your mic on? Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, I, my question is, have the school uh, that, are be, that are going to be part of the programs for this grant have been identified and will be presented on the 17th to the board? So it's a district initiative. All schools are expected to be, to, will pro be provided support. Especially so the positions themselves will be work on targeting and working with schools based on chronic absenteeism. Yeah, choice. The, the MTSS process will be working through, again, each of the regions to make sure that people are trained, that the meetings are happening, they're happening with fidelity, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is often a challenge, and then the student voice, the stipend for someone at the school to manage that is for all schools. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I'd like to be uh, no more and get involved in that project because the truancy, a parent called me the other day and she said, I take my child to school every day, but he's never in his first grade class. I said, do you drop him off late? He says, no, he just doesn't go. I said, then you go need to talk to the principal, and then sometimes he skips school. So that the parent want to come to me, so I'm sending them back to the counselor. Because I have the educational segment first, and then the politic part after, people, parents just are there to listen and call me for questions like, my, I know my child is not going to school, what do I do? So it's great to hear that we will have a program, and I will talk to you about what I've done in Miami-Dade in that effect. Fantastic, yeah. School attendance is a real crisis, and we need to address that. I get, yes. I forgot Bosa, my question. You, <laughs> I forgot it. You forgot it? Okay. All right, well, I'll keep you all updated. I know we're just about at time. Um, I, uh, just, just one other quick update. We are looking for two more agencies for to present uh, next month. Uh, so if you have not stepped up yet, we're looking for you to step up uh, till we get through everybody. Um, I think you all know who you are, so I'm gonna call you out. But um, if you haven't presented yet, please email us, so we're gonna be reaching out to you all individually to present for next month. Um, and I know I have topics from last time that we're working to get through. And I think next month we should have released our latest SEQ data, um, school effectiveness questionnaire. We had really uh, strong participation compared to last year. So that will be enlightening. Um, 
I know there's been alternative ad questions, and then there's also some other topics that I, I need to bring forward to for the group. So I think, and we already finished the unfinished business, Mr. That's Chair, right. we'll do, earlier. Yep, we did that earlier. I do have an announcement. Um, so the Bow Foundation, and I'll share it through staff if they want, we have a $3,000 um, scholar, up to $3,000 scholarship um, that is currently available. And, and there, there is some criteria, but I wanted to share it because the deadline is April 15th. For, for seniors? For seniors, high school seniors, yes. If you send it to me, I can send it out to all the schools. Okay, I'll send it to you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comment, any other question? We'd like to have a motion to adjourn. Second. Who will second? Second. Motion approved. We move. The next meeting will take place on April 24. Same place, same time, same meeting. It's a meeting. Wednesday, but a Wednesday. It, it's a Wednesday. It's a Wednesday, April 24. Come back with a smile and be happy. Looking forward to see you all. Hi. Bye. Thank you all Thank for you. being here.